It gives me immense personal pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Baroness Ruth Deitch, DBE. Not only because Judith and I have been good friends with Ruth and her husband, John, for many years, but also because of the admiration I have for the great contribution she's made, and I say continues to make, to British society generally, and her staunch support and advocacy for the Jewish community, the UK Jewish community, and for Israel. Ruth's father was a refugee who arrived in London from Austria on September the 1st, 1939, the very day the Germans marched into Poland. Two days later, Britain and Germany were, of course, at war. He was a professionally trained lawyer and journalist and was one of the founding members of the World Jewish Congress. Her mother was born in Scotland, but the previous generation of her mother's family was from Poland. A very large number of close family members, including Ruth's grandmother, were killed during the Shoah. Ruth graduated from St. Anne's College, Oxford, with a first-class honours degree in law in 1965, and then did a further MA in Contemporary Jewish Studies at Brandeis University in America. She was called to the bar in 1967 and spent two years teaching law in Canada. She then worked under the Law Commission under her legal hero, the late Lord Scarman, returning to St. Anne's College in 1970 to be a tutorial fellow in law. In American terminology, that means a law professor. And she was elected principal of St. Anne's in 1991 and only retired from that position in 2004. From 1994 to 2002, she was chair of the UK Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, monitoring and dealing with ethical problems arising from in vitro fertilization, embryo, and stem cell research. And she was made a Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire, DBE, in recognition of her work. In 2002, the same year, she was appointed to a four-year term as a governor of the BBC, probably the world's best-known public broadcasting authority. Among her other commitments, she is now the chair of the Bar Standards Board, one of the regulatory bodies governing the legal profession in England. This is a very challenging position, particularly at a time when the profession is going through a period of significant and rapid change. You know, Ruth, Speaking of all these chairmanships, it is said that when a chairman enters a room, he shakes the hands of some of those present and the confidence of everyone else. This is certainly not an accurate description of you, far from it. In 2005, Ruth was appointed a life peer by the House of Lords Appointments Commission, and she sits in the upper house of the British Parliament as a crossbencher i.e. she's really an independent. In the House of Lords, she speaks regularly on a host of different topics, and often on legal issues and matters of Jewish interest or concern. For example, during the Gaza War, she condemned, she condemned the totally disproportionate criticism of Israel. She's raised the issue of, anti of, an of campus anti-Semitism, often disguised as anti-Zionism. Yeah. On the topic of any possible academic boycott of Israel, she stated, and I quote, it's not morally justifiable to hold all Israeli academics collectively responsible for the actions of their government. She's spoken on the restitution of property looted by the Nazis and then the Russians or their former communist client states, her topic today. And indeed, she has spoken on the great contribution made by this university to environmental, environmental collaboration with neighboring states such as Jordan and the work done here on water and solar research. She's a member of the all-party Britain-Israel Parliamentary Group and of the International Council of the American Joint Distribution Committee. At the same time as all of this, she's been a devoted wife to her most supportive husband, John, also a lawyer, and a proud mother of her daughter, Sarah a BBC producer. 
The topic of Ruth's lecture today is restoring our history, Poland, and Jewish property. And Ruth has kindly agreed to answer a few questions after her lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, Ruth Deitch. Good afternoon, everyone. I am proud and privileged to be here in this wonderful university, in this very attractive auditorium, and to speak to you about a topic that is close to my heart and I believe will be of interest to many of you, your family, your ancestors. It's about Poland and Jewish property. Holocaust restitution, I quote, is not about money. It is about victims. It is about individuals who have waited for over 60 years for something. Of course, it's not about perfect justice, but it is about waiting for some recognition to validate the misdeeds that have been perpetrated. Holocaust restitution is not only about the victims, it is also about those who victimize. It is about satisfying the need for a moral accounting regarding the horrific events of the Second World War and some of the communist depredations thereafter. Before the war, 3.3 million Jews lived in Poland. 90% were killed by 1945, and their property was seized by both the German and the Soviet authorities. Indeed, the takeover and redistribution of Jewish property to non-Jews was part of the aims of the Nazis. And some occupied Europeans were not unhappy to take Jewish property, which had been left empty when the occupants were deported, and to loot the contents. Empty apartments were commandeered, and some Poles even kept the property that their Jewish neighbors had entrusted to them for safekeeping, but not always, as we will see. Jews had owned 20% of Warsaw real estate. After the war, the Jewish property was taken over by the communist Polish state. And other industries and businesses and church-owned property was nationalized by the communists. But the Polish government continued to sell and rent out the property, even in the face of claims to it by former owners. A few thousand Jews had returned to Poland after the war and tried to reclaim their property, but they were deterred and frightened into emigration again by incidents such as the Kielce pogrom of 1946. Their properties were treated as abandoned and taken by the state. The Polish government cannot be blamed for the seizure of the properties during the war, but blame does attach to their failure today to ensure that stolen property was returned to the rightful owners when that was once again possible. After the collapse of communism, Poland restored the right to private property and declared the confiscations of the previous eras invalid. Some restitution has been made. Jewish synagogues and cemeteries have been returned to communal bodies. In 1960, Poland signed a treaty with the United States on compensation, and $40 million was given to the United States for this purpose. But it was only for survivors living in the United States, and $40 million did not go very far. Nominal compensation was paid by Poland recently in relation to property east of the Bug River in territories that are no longer Polish. The city of Warsaw has purchased some plots from their former owners, but it remains the situation that there is no law of restitution for private property owners who were Polish, and it's almost impossible for them to make claims because they are left with only one route to initiate private litigation if they have documentary proof. There are a few survivors who still have documentation to prove their ownership, but of course, most of their heirs do not. 
Those who died obviously lost their title deeds and their relatives rely on anecdotes and photographs to establish ownership, often finding archives inaccessible. Those who may have claims will not have the means to pursue them in the Polish courts. They don't live in Poland, they don't speak Polish, they don't know the right lawyers, but above all, they have no proof of ownership. Even those aristocratic non-Jewish families whose ownership of famous estates is well known in Poland have found that their letters go unanswered or legal difficulties are put in their way. Some have even bought their own properties back. According to an article in the London Times recently, more than two decades after Poland became a democracy, the issue of restitution is still a blot on its historical record. The total value of this expropriated property today is about 60 billion US dollars, including buildings, land, and art. Only 17% of the claims are made by Jewish survivors or their relatives. In most cases, there was no one left alive to make a claim and no heirs to inherit it. An entire people was dispossessed. An example is Mr. Koppenheim from Breslau. His grandfather owned a property, there it is, and died in 1940. Had the city remained German, he would have got compensation. But Breslau is now in Poland, and the government allowed this property to be sold to the Tissen group. Mr. Tabaxman, whom I know, his father died in Auschwitz. His mother owned eight apartment blocks and legal action has failed. Mr. Tabaxman is now not well and he's well over 90. He has no time to lose. It is therefore all the more regrettable that the Polish government, which is the only post-communist European country without restitution legislation, appears to be procrastinating, delaying over this issue, while the claimants die or give up. Nearly 70 years after the end of World War II, 25 years since the fall of the Iron Curtain, Jewish and non-Jewish claimants, the non-Jewish are about 80% of the claimants, they are struggling to recover property situated in Poland, property that was taken from them by the Nazi and communist regimes. Romania, Latvia, Lithuania, Hungary, and Turkey are countries that have recently taken some legislative steps to do justice, leaving Poland isolated. A small amount of money would represent a cleansing, a true release and settlement with the past. The trauma of human loss in the war was so great that no discussion of the material loss took place for decades, allowing the situation to become even more complicated. As is well known, the Germans made reparations after the end of the war. With the collapse of communism 25 years ago and the end of the Cold War, attention began to be focused on the unfinished war business of the newly liberated nations of Europe. Over the last 20 years, many draft laws, about 12, providing for restitution, have been prepared in Poland but never enacted. Most were unsatisfactory in any case, because they excluded Warsaw, or required Polish citizens now, or excluded certain types of property or persons affected by certain treaties, and had drastic cut-off dates for claims. At best, these Polish draft laws only offered about 20% of the value. But this is not a question of full compensation or even adequate return. It is an issue of principle for Jewish and non-Jewish claimants alike. When I've raised this topic in public in England, I am sometimes asked 
whether the Jews should not compensate the Palestinians equally for property that was lost. The reply is obvious. If a small amount of compensation was all that it took to settle the Palestinian issue, there would have been peace long ago. That's not the issue. In 2012, this year, Poland again stopped draft legislation on the ground that Poland could not afford compensation. But now Poland is one of the few European countries to have avoided the recession and had a 4.3% growth in GDP last year. Poland is Europe's big success story with consistent economic growth and the stock exchange stronger than Vienna's. According to the National Bank of Poland, the inflow of foreign direct investment between January and October 2011 amounted to more than 9 billion euros, 34% more than in the whole of 2010, and more than enough to pay compensation to the dispossessed if the money had been directed their way. Nevertheless, this year, Poland even stopped the mechanism that had existed to facilitate the return of communal property that had been seized before the work had been finished. The latest information I have is that Poland has no plans to enact restitution legislation for at least five years and expects claimants to take individual legal action in Polish courts, even though some of the relevant confiscation laws have not been repealed. Poland claims that paying even partial compensation would add significantly to the national debt and exceed debt limits imposed by the Maastricht Treaty. Poland claims it cannot afford to pay its historical dues the greater question is whether Poland can afford not to. A shadow is hanging, not only over the title to disputed properties, but the very record of Polish resistance to Nazism. Poorer states than Poland have managed to make some recompense. The desire to join Europe or NATO was a powerful factor in persuading other states that they had to accept European human rights principles and Article 1 of Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which protects property. The European Commission at first required Poland to make restitution as a condition of entry to the European Union, but dropped the condition at the last moment after a plea of poverty by Poland. Once Poland was in Europe, that leverage was lost, although there are relevant obligations under European law. International and European law is of some assistance, but individual claims are enormously lengthy and expensive to conduct. The United Nations Human Rights Committee has held that discrimination in restitution law based on nationality is in violation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Now, because of legal restrictions on discrimination, Poland is anxious that it might also have to pay compensation to dispossessed Germans who once lived on Polish property and territory if it pays compensation to the former Polish Jewish residents. Poland accepted the United Nations Covenants in 1977 and the European Convention on Human Rights in 1993. The European Court of Human Rights has before it the case of this man here, Henrik Pikelny, which has been before it since 2005, seven years. He was a survivor, born in 1928, who eventually settled in Brazil. The Nazis took his grandfather's business in Woj, which was a textile factory, established in 1889 and then the communists nationalized that same factory by a law of 1946. That law of 1946 provided for compensation 
for people who had their property taken, but this provision was never implemented. The Polish government refuses to return the property, even though Mr. Pikelny started to claim it in 1990. He has now died without justice. The European Court is delaying other similar claims pending further litigation in Poland. In July 2001, the OSCE urged states to ensure that they have implemented appropriate legislation to secure restitution or compensation for property loss by victims of Nazi persecution and their heirs. And again, Poland opted out, unfortunately, from the Charter of Fundamental Rights in the Lisbon Treaty, which might have provided another avenue for claims. For 20 years, the United States has urged Poland to do the right thing. The American Congress passed Resolution 371 in 2008, calling on the government of Poland to enact legislation to address the issue of private property and ensure that such restitution and compensation legislation establishes an unbureaucratic simple, transparent, and timely process so that it results in a real benefit to those many persons who suffered from the unjust such confiscation of their property, many of whom are well into their 80s or older. The American Senate has also supported restitution by Poland. When the Americans criticized Poland's slowness, the Americans provoked an angry response from the Polish Foreign Minister, Radek Sikorski. This is what Sikorski said. He said, if the US really wanted to do something for Poland's Jews, a good moment would have been in the years 1943 to 44, when most of them were still alive, and when Poland pleaded for that through the testimony of Jan Karski. Why, you may ask, am I interested in this topic? Some family history. My grandfather, Moses Frankel, born, I think, about 1860, came to Uschikidolny, near Przemysl, to marry Tova Singer. He prospered. He owned an oil refinery, and he was mayor of the village for 25 years. He had six children. My father, Joseph, was the fifth. My, on my mother's side, my maternal grandmother, Rosenfeld, owned an apartment block in Krakow. I believe it to be the property at 41 Druga, which is now the Aston Hostel, a cheap tourist accommodation, which advertises itself as follows. Our hostel is situated in the center of Krakow, in the typical Krakow tenement house. Yes, yes one of those buildings that make this town so magical and unique, really, seven minutes from the main market square. When I was a child, my father would tell me stories about Uschikidolny and about the prosperity and hospitality of his father, the mayor. I never believed him, at least about the prosperity, until I made a trip to the village in 1994, I was received by the current mayor who showed me my grandfather's house, his office, and took me to see the deserted oil refinery which he had owned. It was at that stage that I started to wonder who owns it now? But I've never been able to discover how title passed or what claim I might have Indeed, I have older relatives who I'm happy to say are here in the audience today. 
although I believe the village archives are detailed on that subject. I have spoken about this many times in the British Parliament and to the press. And consequently, I came to know the famous British historian of Poland, Professor Norman Davis, who lives near me in Oxford. As a result of the publicity and my friendship with him, my story about Uszczyki Dolny and the family property was reprinted in the Polish newspapers and it was brought to the attention of a celebrated Polish painter, Eugeniusz Waniek, in 2008. That's a picture of him there. He was then 101 and living in Krakow. Before the war, he and his family were non-Jewish neighbors of my family, the Frankels, in Uszczyki Dolny. His mother had tutored the Frankel children in geography and French, and they had all played together. A friend of Mr. Vanyek read my story in the Krakow paper with the mention of Uszczyki Dolny, and the friend said to Vanyek, did you know the Frankel family? The response from Vanyek was, my God, how do you know about them? I knew the family very well, and I have a package from them. He got up from his chair, went to a drawer, and produced a bundle. At that stage, I was contacted by Professor Norman Davis and was urged to fly to Krakow as soon as possible to meet the old man and receive something from him. I went within the week with my daughter and cousins to meet him. And this was his story. Vanyek had been teaching art in Krakow after growing up in Uszczyki Dolny. Visiting his village in 1939, Uszczyki Dolny, he ended up trapped there throughout the war. After the Red Army invaded at the start of the war, Vanyek's own sister had been sent to Kazakhstan where she starved to death. In 1941, the Germans entered Uszczyki Dolny and looted it. Vanyek saw two women being shot dead for refusing to hand over their valuables. At that stage, my father's sister, Helena, who was still living there after the other brothers and sisters had scattered or been deported, hurriedly handed over to him 16 silver knives and forks, hastily wrapped in a linen tablecloth to guard while the Germans were rounding up the Jews. She said to him, keep it until we get back. Vanyek bravely buried the cutlery in his garden, an offense for which he could have been executed. After the war, he resumed his painting career in Krakow and he took the cutlery with him and he kept it hidden there too, waiting for over 67 years for a claimant to appear. In the days before the internet, he was unable to locate surviving members of the Frankel family and he had no idea where any of them went after the war. When I arrived in his apartment, he was able to return to me the cutlery and the original tablecloth. He died six months later, age 102, having said, that's it, I can go now. The cutlery had to remain in Krakow in Professor Davis's flat until I could get an export license. And then I brought it home with my daughter by train from Krakow to Berlin, from Cologne to Brussels, and finally to London. For, as you know, it is impossible to carry knives in your hand luggage on board a plane, and I was certainly not going to put it in a suitcase in the hold. A small thing, as you see, but enormously valuable emotionally and symbolically an expression of how brave 
some poles could be, and the chance for me to touch the only objects ever also touched by the relatives I never knew. My determination to make a claim for the real property in the village, however, is as great as ever and frustrated as ever. So it was with interest that I discovered that there had been a series of conferences on the issue of restitution. They started with the 1997 London Conference on Nazi Looted Gold, then the 1998 Washington Conference, the 2000 Stockholm Conference on Holocaust Education, and then the Vilnius Conference on Cultural Property, and then the conference that resulted in the Terezin Declaration, the 2009 Prague Conference on Holocaust-era assets, which I attended. Adopted by 47 countries, including the United Kingdom, the declaration called for participating states to meet the social and medical needs of the 500,000 Holocaust survivors, of whom half are on the poverty line. The declaration called for the restitution of wrongful property seizures, forced sales, and sales under duress in the Nazi period, for the identification and restitution of cultural property seized by the Nazis, much of which is in Russia, which is not a signatory to the declaration. It called for open access to the archives, the preservation of memorials, and for measures to combat anti-Semitism. In 2010, there was a follow-up conference which produced guidelines about best practice in property restitution, the most intractable problem. Solution to this would remove the cloud that hangs over the title to many properties in Eastern Europe. Clearly, any compensation process should be accessible, simple, quick, avoid residency and other onerous requirements and of low cost. States should open up their archives, they should not require too much proof, and they should, of course, respect the occupancy rights of current good faith residents. Poland did not sign up to the guidelines. The achievements in this field, apart from Poland, are considerable. There have been settlements of the issues relating to dormant bank accounts in Switzerland and unclaimed insurance benefits. There have been payments to former slave laborers and some restoration of communal religious property. The European Shoah Legacy Institute has been established in Prague by the Czech government to supervise follow-up. The United Kingdom, to its great credit, has a Holocaust Stolen Art Restitution Act 2009, which enables museums to give back looted art to the original owners. The checking of the origin of artworks, which might have changed hands in the Nazi period, is now routine. Art dealers are aware of it. The United Kingdom and also the United States have got envoys, ambassadors, for post-Holocaust issues. In your case, some the Americans, it was Stuart Eisenstadt and then Douglas Davison. In our case, in Britain, it's the former diplomat, Sir Andrew Burns. And the London Vena Library hosts the International Tracing Service, a digital record of 17.5 million people of the Holocaust. The government of Israel was reluctant to get involved. And many of the survivors here in Israel felt that to accept any, as they saw it, tainted money was immoral. But now Israel has set up a database of half a million pieces of stolen property called Project Heart. The list is being compiled from individuals and archives, and the idea is to move to legal and public action. I urge all of you who may have an interest to look on the internet for Project Heart and fill in the claim form. Of course, Israel's ties with Poland internationally are good, and this makes it very difficult to push forcefully on these issues. Poland has been a supporter of Israel internationally. So what can one do? 
All governments that honor the rule of law should persuade Poland to participate in the 2012 Conference on Holocaust-era assets, to set up a restitution mechanism, and all governments should support America in its approaches to Poland. Poland should do what Austria did. In 2001, Austria set up a general settlement fund to resolve all remaining issues. They set up a committee with relaxed standards of proof. They used 1938 property records, witness statements, and birth certificates, and put $210 million in the fund for compensation so that claimants did not have to take individual legal action at their own cost, which is what Poland thinks should be done. This is the model that all other Eastern European countries should adopt, the Austrian one, which again you can find on the internet. The Austrians accepted their moral responsibility and became leaders in this field. Other countries should do the same open their archives, help the claimants with research and the commencement of claims. Poland should pay something going back to 1939, right through to the end of communist rule in Poland relating to property. You cannot leave people to do it on their own. They should allow proof of ownership from witnesses, from concentration camp records, birth and death records. They should help people by putting property records accessibly in a central place. They should remove the conditions like holding Polish citizenship or making people pay back taxes on property, which they had to abandon. It is a difficult issue for Poland, but one that must be faced, not only because of the bitter memories remaining and the moral claims, but because of European and human rights responsibilities, Poland must take the obligations of European law, along with the benefits which she has taken enthusiastically of membership of Europe. I quote, millions of Poles, both Jewish and Christian, were stripped of everything, homes, land, businesses, forests, factories, and furniture. Poland rightly insists that humanity has a sacred obligation never to forget what happened on its soil. The most powerful memorial to that duty is Auschwitz, where a foundation has been set up to preserve the crumbling buildings, gas chambers and crematoria where more than one million Jews were murdered. Millions of dollars have been contributed to Auschwitz preservation from countries in the West. This gesture only makes more stark the failure to do justice in a way more relevant to the survivors. Poland must give back what was taken under Nazism, kept under communism, what was promised and never repaid. The world owes a huge debt of memory to Poland, but so does Poland. The war cost lives, professions, cultural and religious heritage, real and personal property, insurance benefits and art. Sharansky, whom we heard this morning, said, the Holocaust was not only genocide, it was also the greatest theft in history. Justice is in sight if the nations of the civilized world will use their good offices to ensure the implementation of the Terrorism Declaration. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.